Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome, 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 So, big thanks also to. Big thanks also. I don't need this, do I need this? No, it's just the beautiful Can it be the presenter factor because it's sharing the screen? What you mean? That one's got the mic turned on. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. There's a mic on on there. Mute your mic. It's just it's just no idea. It should be able to go into the main system. Through the app. Yeah, that's true. No idea. Anyway, I'm going to carry on. So, big thank you to Skills Master Housing. Yes, it's great to be able to be here to have this great space. The hashtag is Pop London. Um, if anybody wants to talk to Future Meetup, please um, talk to Amy. She's just there on the middle corner. Um, yeah, if you need more speakers, it'd be great. Um, and of course, I have to say, we're glad you're hiring. Uh, <laughs> as that saying. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, anyway. Um, first speaker is John. So <clears throat> so, have you turned my sound off? Yeah. Uh, I I'll try. I'll, I'll try first. Yeah, you'll need sound. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second speaker, Odell, is going to be just speaking afterwards. Um, yeah, and we'll do questions in between. And there's lots of pizza and more beer at the bar, so I have no sound in No, I know I've had to switch it off because it's all echoing still. I'll need to Actually, I turned it off completely. Oh, really? So it's definitely on me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay. I'm going to point B for the presentation. So. Okay. Well, what's going on then? Why? Why? Tell me what's going on. It was feeding back. Something was feeding back. Yeah, I turned this off completely. It's not me. Okay. It's it's off. Okay. Try now. I'm trying to play. Okay. Yeah, but they're not fitting anymore. Yeah. No, I don't have the pictures. <laughs> But can I? Is your microphone still on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it is, but uh, it's it sure almost yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not, he says. We shouldn't. So I don't know why I have this problem. Sorry. <laughs> okay, give, give me two seconds, okay? Yeah. Keep, keep your file playing. Oh, the file still? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Can only be you. Can only be you. No, the microphone is off. Do you know who's that? I can die. Do you know who's that? I can die. Do you have to write the... The dear? Yeah. Let's write the Okay. So do you want the feedback again, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why are you getting who are you getting started program? The hangout was playing the sound, but it was yeah. Yes, but why? It was an S machine. Who's, who's because, recording? Because it's because the hangout has the stream on it. Yeah. So you were recording in sound. Broadcasting. But why was it? Everything because his microphone was picking up the sound coming from the hangout and back out. His microphone was everything. But his no, microphone wasn't. So we could see that. The speaker I think, I think the, the problem was the microphone was coming in from the internet into the hangout and out yeah, the speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's check your mic now. Sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you? Yeah. Yeah. Works. <laughs> okay. Ah, I don't know what's happening here.
No, I'm not. I can't get my presentation working. I can't run. Oh, my goodness. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I start? Right. Very many apologies for this uh, this long delay and the uh, getting the sound system all wrong. Um, uh, my name is John Watson. I'm down as John Watson GMX, uh, but I don't work for GMX. That's just my email address. So uh, I used to work uh, in this area. Uh, I'm no now longer gainfully employed. Um, so my advanced age. And uh, so I'm using Elm as a hobby, uh, and I've been looking at it for about um, seven or eight months. And um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is Elm, the programming language, and also audio, and um, uh, to what extent it's advisable to use Elm, how it helps you, and how it hinders you if you want to do audio applications. Um, so basically what I'm going to talk about is the browser audio APIs that exist in the, in the web audio platform. Then a little bit about sound fonts, which are um, not, I don't think, very well, uh, very widely used, but I find very useful. A um, little bit about how you would write an Elm library and what the drawbacks are, uh, where you can, where you can't write them. And then the brunt of the talk is going to be about this thing called the ABC notation. And uh, what that is is a way of notating musical scores just using basically text, the letters A, B, C, and one or two other characters. And how you'd write a parser for that language. So the brunt of the talk is going to be about parsers. Um, and I think what I'd like to try to convince you today is that writing a parser um, for a significant language that actually runs in the browser is a very practical thing to do with Elm. So um, if you're convinced of that already, then fine. Uh, you may not learn very much from the talk. But if you're not, I'm hoping to convince you that writing such a parser is very useful. Uh, and of course, I, we're using functional language, so it's functional parsers we're, we're talking about. So start with the, the, the audio APIs. Uh, there are two of them only. Um, there's one called Web Audio, and what that is, that's quite a big API, long document. And what's that, what that's for is for uh, sound synthesis. So if you wanted to um, develop a synthesizer uh, that ran in the browser, uh, and you were sort of making your own noises, uh, a lot of people do um, sort of live, live uh, demos of, 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 of changing um, changing the sounds and drum beats and so forth, uh, different effects. You could use Web Audio to do that. Um, web MIDI is for if you had a MIDI device, uh, such as an, um, a MIDI piano, and you could plug it in to your computer, and the browser would pick it up. And then you could play the keyboard and play it through the browser. Um, now, the, the part of Web, I'm not, not going to talk about Web MIDI at all today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about web audio, but my interest in it is very narrow. So um, I'm interested in an actual musical score and playing it so it sounds reasonable uh, with, a, with an instrument that sounds sort of OK. Um, uh, and what a sound font will do is basically you can start off with sample sounds from physical instruments. So um, I've, I've actually chosen to use an electric piano, uh, um, a concert piano, a uh, concert grand piano. And these have been sampled with all the different notes in the scale. And then um, saved to disk. And then what sound, the sound fonts will do is they will, they will, they will actually store this as, um, as um, uh, 
what's it called? Uh, uh, J, J, uh, J, uh, sorry, start again. So <laughs> we'll, we'll save this as JSON. Um, so what you get is a, a, set, of, a set of notes um, for, for, in the piano for, for an octave, um, encoded as JSON. And then these are available on a website. The one I use is um, a guy called Glites. Uh, it's called MIDI.js, sound, sound fonts there. And so what you can do is you can, you can um, take these sound fonts, you can then, um, uh, they're um, uh, encoded, so you can just decode them um, when, you, when, you get, when you get them um, into uh, 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 to a, to a binary audio buffer, which is the thing that uh, the web audio will use. So how would Elm use these, um, these sound font libraries? Now, eventually, there's going to be um, a library, I'm sure, called Elm Lang Audio. And the trouble is that there isn't one yet, and there's not a very clear indication of when we're going to get Elm Lang Audio. Um, there was a promise with Elm 0.17 that there'd be a lot of the web API would be wrapped uh, in Elm. It hasn't happened yet, and it's not clear to me exactly how Evan, uh, the, um, the inventor of Elm, intends this to, to, to go on. Um, he, he may want to do it all himself, or he may get the Elm community to, to help him out, but it's not absolutely clear to me how this is going to happen. Um, I was hoping that it would be available already. It isn't. So you can't yet take an off-the-shelf library from Elm and, and do web audio stuff. There are other attempts to do it. So this um, Troth A01 uh, has, has, uh, has got this Elm Web, web Audio um, library, but it's not a sanctified library. It never will be, um, because the, the rules for when you can actually use uh, your code as a library are very strict in Elm. And this will never be allowed to happen uh, under, the, under the present rules. So you're stuck with one way of actually accessing the um, web audio API at the moment in Elm, and that's to use ports. And what ports are is basically you would um, you'd have to write your um, your 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 um, web audio application in JavaScript. So you've got a function in JavaScript, and you would call it essentially by sending it a message from Elm, and then your JavaScript will send will will, will be executed, and then it will send a message back to Elm with the answer. Um, and so the only really option we've got to use audio and Elm at the moment is to use, use ports into JavaScript. But they come with a lot of problems too. So the, um, the main problem is that you're not allowed to actually develop a library that uses ports. So you know there are a lot of Elm libraries in the Elm community area, and it's very, very simple to integrate them. You just uh, um, just just bring them down when you um, uh, create your JSON file with your with your different um, different bits and pieces that you want to um, you, you want to include um, and very very simple to integrate. But because you're not allowed to use ports in libraries, this option isn't open to you. Also, if you're using ports, they're difficult to distribute. So you um, compile your Elm down to JavaScript. And then, if you want to actually make an application out of it, you've got to um, you've got to um, make it up, assemble it by hand. Um, so, so the consequence of this is that there's no real distribution of libraries in audio. You can do it yourself and have your own little library, which you can sort of assemble by hand. But you can't redistribute really it to lots of other people. And then the last thing about it is that uh, with audio, anyway, some audio applications need to um, be very strictly timed. So you, you need to, in, in some applications, you need to know that when you actually fire off a note, there's no delay at all. It will play exactly when you want it to play. Other applications, not, uh, such as the one I'm going to show you, uh, it's not so important. Um, so that's, uh, that's a sort of uh, a, a warning about uh, the, the extent to which you can use audio in, in Elm or not. But having said that, they do work very well. So you've got full access to JavaScript. JavaScript can quite happily let you build a load of buffers up with, with, which represent your sound fonts, and you can play them. OK, so what I'm going to talk about 
mostly is this particular notation for describing a musical score. And it's called the ABC notation. And it's called ABC because it just uses the letters ABC up to G for the different notes in the scale. It was designed by a guy in London called Chris Walshaw. And I think it's been going for about 20 years. It's quite, quite a well-established standard. But it's mostly used in the areas of music that I'm interested in, which are traditional music. So I'm interested in particularly in traditional Irish and Scandinavian music. And if you want to swap scores with people just for the melody, um, then this is a very, very convenient way for, for doing so. And there are a variety of traditional music websites. Um, in particular, there's one for Irish music called thesession.org, which has got a huge bank of tunes, probably, I don't know, 20,000 tunes in there, all of ABC notation. So I'm going to try to explain how you would, what, well, what, what the ABC notation is and how you develop a parser for it. So if you've got the C major scale on here, you'd very simply represent it with the letters C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and actually that other C should be a small case C. Um, and so that is the, that's the, that's the musical score. The M just says it's in 4-4 four, four meter. And then these um, vertical strikes are the vertical lines of the bar lines. And so that score can very simply be represented as C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So to show you that what that would look like. Um, that? And I don't know why that is not working. There we go. So, um, so this is the the piece of software that I've been developing, and so we can see. Can you can you read the letters on the top? So um, you can you can you can type in in the top here what your tune is, and then you can play the scale. What this is is it's um, it's got a parser running in the background all the time. So if you were to write some rubbish down here, it didn't understand, then you get an error message and the player switches off. So every time you key a stroke, it's parsing the, the ABC. And then as long as you get the um, um, little player at the bottom, then it, you know that you've got legitimate ABC and you can play it. So um, another thing you might want to do is to do a chord. And so we've got C, D, and E. This time I've got a two bit uh, at the other side of them, which means that the, the notes are twice as long as before. And then the, the square brackets at the end, we've got C, D, and E together, and that represents those three notes we played at the same time. So let's show that one. So here, here's the same thing again. And if we play that one, We get rather poor piece of music, but nevertheless, we've got the chord. Another one. Um, looks like. That's my presentation. There we go. And the last thing um, I want to show you in, in um, musical notation that I'm actually going to talk about today is triplets. Um, so what a triplet is, is if you have three notes that take the time of two, and you indicate that with a curly bracket and then a three to represent a triplet. You can have other um, numbers in there, so four would represent a quadruplet. So what that would sound like is... Huh. So there's the same thing. Um, so
So, um, for the rest of the talk, I, I'd like to talk about how you would develop a parser for the language that I've just shown you. Um, I'm using a thing called uh, a library from a guy called Bogdan Popper, uh, called Elm Combine. And it's um, a, what's called a parser combinator library. And if any of you use Haskell, it's, it's very, very similar to Parsec. So if you're very familiar with Parsec, this will probably be quite familiar to you. Um, and why I like it is because it's, it's, it's a very practical choice, because not only have you got the sort of pure functional uh, aspects of it, but if you really need to get into the nitty gritty and, and provide something which is um, maybe slightly unusual, for example, I had to provide slightly different error messages, then there are sort of hooks into, into it to, to allow you to do rather devious things. Uh, and, and pr provide a real-world parser. And you had absolutely first-class support from, from Bogdan. So I, I very strongly recommend it. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about now is uh, a, a tiny version of ABC, which is the, uh, what I've been showing before, cut down to the bare essentials. I want you to consider a, um, a musical uh, environment where you've only got a major scale of the white notes. Well, you've only got the white notes on the piano for two octaves. And then the only things you can really do is you can play the notes, you can have bar lines, or you can have chords and triplets, and then you can have spaces between, between the notes. So I'm going to start with um, a data type in Elm, which just says my music is either going to be a bar line, or it's going to be a note, or it's going to be a chord, or it's going to be a tuplet, which is a, a generic form of a triplet, or it's going to be spaces. And what I want you to know from this is that each of those constructions there implies a function, a constructor function. So for example, the tuplet, you can think of as a function called tuplet with two parameters, an integer parameter, which is in, is it in three time or four time, and then a list of notes. So it's got a couple of parameters. And it's just a function. And because it's just a function, then you can do things like um, partially apply it, and this will be useful later. So if you can just remember that for, 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 for the future. Um, and then, basically, just to, to drill down from um, some of these things that we talked about there, an ABC note and an ABC chord. Oops. Uh, I want then that's, they're just uh, straight, straightforward type aliases for a note. So a note is just going to be a pitch, either A to G or little a to G, and that's going to be slightly higher note, and a duration. And a chord is just going to be a list of notes with a duration for the chord. So if you're going to develop a, a functional parser, then how you, a, a functional a functional parser is different, really, from an imperative parser. An imperative parser is, a big, is a, a parser is a big monolithic thing. But a functional parser, in fact, what you have is lots of little parsers. Um, and you build up the entire parser just by combining them together in a variety of ways. And the parser I'm going to use, there's only four primitive things I'm going to use. I'm going to, get to have a character. So what that will do is say, um, if I see the letter C as my character, then I'm going to have a parser that will recognize the letter C if I say a char C, for example. Um, so either if you come across the, bit, the next bit of your text, if it, if it is a C, it'll pass. If it's not, it'll fail. Similarly, a digit, you can parse a digit, single, single numeric value, or an integer, which might be multiple digits. Um, or you can have a parser which just recognizes one of a list of characters where um, you give it a list of characters which are allowed, and it'll give you a parser for that, for that character. So those are the fundamental primitive parsers. And then when you want to uh, do something properly with it, you have to combine them. So you, you're given in this, in this library a lot of combinators which allow you to, um, uh, to join them together. So for example, there are a couple of functions, many or many one, and what that will do is will take a parser, a list uh, uh, will uh, give you a list of um, 
will actually parse a list of um, uh, small parses that you've got already. Or you might have a choice where you can say, maybe your language says it's either going to be a note or a chord, say. And so you can give it a choice for a parser for a note or a parser for a chord. And the choice will parse. And if it's either of the two, it'll, it'll, it'll succeed. And you'll get the result. Or maybe you have an optional thing, something that maybe will there, be there and maybe won't. So there's a, another combinator called maybe. And so you, you have maybe there's, for example, a char. But if there isn't, it'll, uh, if there is, you'll get a parser success of maybe res. But if not, then you'll pass on to the next, to, 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 to the next option if, if, it's, if it's not there. And finally, between, what this will do is um, you can parse something which might be between, shall we say, two brackets. If you've got a list of things between a left bracket and a right bracket, you can throw away the brackets and you can get um, a list of things in between them. So in my language, um, tiny ABC language, probably the simplest thing is a bar line. And so a bar line will give you music because bar, a bar will just construct a, a portion of music for you, which is just a bar. And so a parser for a bar line is very simply, you're going, to you're going to recognize the char of a vertical bar, if it's there. And then what this funny left arrow dollar does is then it's, it's like map, but it throws away the result. So basically, if it, represent, if it recognizes the vertical bar in your text that you're parsing, then that will succeed. And it will just return bar line, which if, if you look back to the constructor, if we go back a bit. So bar line is a constructor without any parameters. So that will just give you some music if it parses. And then for an actual note, you first have to work out the pitch and duration. So here's an example of how one of might work. You can have a list of pitches that we recognize, uh, the big letters A to G and the small letters A to G. And so a pitch is just one of those. And a duration is, well, we're going to default to a duration of one. If, if, if you have a note A1, it's the same as saying a note A. So one is the, is the default uh, length for a note. And uh, so a duration we're using the maybe combinator. So if we see a number, say three, then it'll return a parser of th with, the re with the result three inside it. If it doesn't, uh, if there is no number there in the duration where we're expecting one, it'll just default to a, um, a value of one. And this dollar sign there is a synonym for map. So basically what happens here is you parse the maybe and then you map the value onto the duration. So the duration takes uh, a value of, of whatever you, the maybe will give you and returns your parser of integer. And then we move to the actual note itself. So a parser for a note, a note is in this tiny language, is just going to be pitch and a duration. So what this does is it recognizes the pitch. It recognizes the duration. Now that bracket star, that two brackets with a star inside it, is means and map. And this dollar is basically mapping this constructor function over both those values. So we've got a, a function here which builds a node, and it takes two parameters, a char and an int, and will give you a node. And so how this works is that It'll parse the pitch, parse the duration, have these two values if it's, if it's parsed successfully, and then you can map this function over those two values and return your overall note. note. And this is an example of what's called applicative style. So although you haven't got type classes in Elm, um, you can still use the applicative way of programming in Elm if you use this library in just the same way as you would do with Haskell. Um, And then lastly, the, la the last um, features that we had in our little language were chords and tuplets. So a chord is just 
basically something between the two brackets, which we're going to throw away with the between operator. And it's just many, many, many one notes. You've got to have one note there. Um, and then there's a possible duration of the chord as well. You can have afterwards. And so again, in exactly the same way, you apply the um, an ABC chord constructor, which is one of our um, basic things in our data type we had at the beginning, which needed two parameters to, to, to build the music. So here our chord is just apply the chord constructor to those two parameters you've picked up. And lastly, tuplet. Um, a tuplet, you're going to recognize this left bracket thing, which you're going to throw away because you don't need it. But you are going to find a digit, which is, is it like a, a three, a triplet with a three or a quadruplet with a four? This funny symbol here, the, the, the star with the right-hand bracket, means that you throw away this value, just retain that one. So you've got a value here that you're going to pick up. You've got the old um, and then operator for many nodes. So that's just going to basically give you two, 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 two things. It's going to give you whether it's a, tuplet, a triplet or quadruplet in the number, and it's going to give you a bunch of notes. And then when you apply that constructor, you get music out of it in the end. And then to put it all together, the entire melody is just a choice. So you've got basically parses for a bar line, parses for a note, parses for a chord, a tuplet, white space, which I'm not showing you, but that's very straightforward. So these, these are just a choice of five, diff five different things. And then you apply the many one operator, uh, many one combinator to, to those. And so music is just lots and lots and lots of those values, either bar lines and so on to tuplets, repeated lots of times until you build up the entire melody. And then at the end, what you would do is you would just supply a function parse, which you pass the parameters of your parser, your top level parser, because this gives you music, a list of music, and the, so you give it the, uh, the parser that you've built up, top level parser, and you'll give it the text that you want to, um, that you want to parse. And that will either give, that'll give you a result, which either says it's a successful parse, or it'll give you an error message. So um, to finish off, I'll just show you a little bit more of the application. Um, let's choose Frere Jaca. So the, the actual ABC language is slightly more complicated than this tiny version I've shown you. So for example, um, we've got some metadata at the top and that K says that this piece is in the key of G. And the dots, the double, the, the, uh, the, bar, uh, the dots after the bar line represent repeats. So what this will do is it will have two phrases, the G2A2 and so on phrase and the B2C2 phrase. It'll repeat each one. Um, so what you get is a repeat of the first phrase and a repeat of the second phrase. Um, and then what you can do is once you've parsed this, you can, you've, got, you've got essentially a parse tree in memory, and you can manipulate the parse tree. So we can, for example, um, put the whole thing up an octave. So that's up an octave. And you can see there's a slight extension to the, to the language because we've got a C with a prime after it, which means it's, it's a higher. A higher note. Similarly, you can go down. So if you go down a couple of octaves, then we've got um, the sort of comma after the notes to represent um, a lower note. And you can go, of course, even even lower. Again, you get two commas, which I'm not sure we'll hear this. And. Um, and the last thing I can show you is that if you want to change the key, then you can transpose it. So supposing we wanted to, I don't know, transpose this from G major to E major, you can then do that.
And then at the very end, um, what a typical file will look like, and this is this is a, a Swedish tune called Lila Sister and a Polska. Uh, it's something like this. So the, the page I've developed allows you to write just the letters A and B, but actually that's not a completely comprehensive um, file if you wanted to give it to one of these other websites. You've got to give it a lot more metadata. Um, and so um, the key ones are the, uh, the meter, M. This one's in 9.8. The length of a unit note, um, the rhythm, and obviously the key. Uh, the rest of the information, like the, like the name and the X, is is just a ridiculous hangover that shouldn't really be needed. Um, but then, just to give you the beginning of this, uh, this is how Lila System sounds. And so on. So, I think that's just about it, just to... Um, just to summarize, what I really wanted to talk to you about was the extent to which you can use ALM to do audio um, for a sort of conventional musical scores. Um, encourage you to use sound fonts if, you, if you're interested in doing this because you could have any variety of sound you like. There are sound fonts for harps and trumpets and violins and so forth, quite good quality. A little bit about libraries, the extent to which they're um, usable for doing this sort of stuff in ALM. Um, and then lastly, functional parsers. I encourage you to use functional parsers if you've got any parsing needs because they're actually very, very simple to use, very straightforward. They're, they're, uh, you've got to get used to the notation with the, with the stars and the brackets and things. It actually is very simple to use, um, and I would recommend them to you. And that's all I have to say. So <laughs> if there's any questions, uh, I'd, be, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Yes? It's like... Are there any restrictions on the grammars you can parse with that library? Or I, this particular technique? I don't think so, no. Uh, I've not come across one. Um, I've written two parsers so far. So I've written, I've written one for ABC. I've also written one for General MIDI, which is a binary um, uh, format, and I had no trouble with that either. So I haven't come across any restrictions. Is it online anywhere? Can we have a look? Yeah, it's all on the GitHub account. Oh, you can, so, awesome. yeah. Thank you. can we see the, the app again, please? See the your 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 uh, browser app. Yeah. Um. So I, I was curious about uh, something to do with the ABC notation. So when you okay. uh, transpose to a different key. Yeah. Go on, go on, uh, yeah. I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> Not that one. Yes, keep, walk, keep talking. I'll um, go eventually. Oh, so no. you had a piece of metadata that says uh, yeah. what key it was in. Yeah. And so could you change the, could you, for example, uh, transpose it to a different key? Yeah, well? which key would you like? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> e. Let's e. do E. Uh, so, like it, so not only did the, the key metadata change, but also the, the sequence of notes yeah. changed. So that's nothing to do with parsing. That was to do with work yes, behind the, hand. The question, yeah, yeah. question about the, the notation. Yeah. Um, does that mean that, like, it's sort of redundant than the key metadata if it's also in the, in the notes. Um, how it works is that if it's, um, if it's, let's start with key of G, right? That's got an F sharp in the key of G. So what the notation says is that if you've got an F down here, it's implicitly F sharp. So every F is sharpened because the key is G. And if you go to D, that's got, shall we say, uh, it's got a, a, as well, it's got a C sharp as well as the F sharp. And so if you were to transpose that to D, then um, implicitly every C that you would have in your text at the bottom would be a C sharp. Does that answer your question? Or? Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> so the, um, the map and, and what's it called in, in um, and map uh, notation, was yeah. that part of the parser? Yes. Yes, it's, they're, so it's, they're so all it's a generic thing. You know? They're all generic, all part, all part of the parser, I guess. Yeah. All, well, part, all part of the parser generator, the, the, uh, the, the, yeah, yeah, the library, yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Great. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, next, you have Bird on. Okay. 
Yes. Um, first, we're going to need to do a font check. In the back, how much bigger do I need to make it? That was in the front, so clearly it has to be a lot bigger. Is that good in the back? Good. You're wearing glasses, though. You probably see it better than most. OK, let's, let's go for this. OK. <coughs> so we'll see how this goes. I literally just finished um, writing this talk on the train down back to London. As it pulled into Euston Station, I finished writing the last slide. Then I added some during the previous talk. So this will be very exciting. There's a lot of moving parts as well. I've got like four language, five languages to, to demo, like the entire tool chain. Of, so so uh, nothing can go wrong here at all, certainly. Um, just to make it worse, I actually sort of ran off to the country uh, for a couple of days previous to this. So I don't have like peace and quiet to write my talk and don't stress out about it. In the end, of course, the, the three hour train ride is when I actually wrote the content. And um, out in the country, I was writing uh, the, the, the slide presentation tool, essentially, which is how I procrastinate about writing talks. Um, there's moving parts there as well. This is like completely untested. It will be a lot of fun to see if it works even slightly. Um, so be, be prepared for breakage. Um, the idea of the talk. So essentially, I've, I've seen a lot of introductions to language A, language B, so on uh, at this kind of meetup. Like, there's been, I think, probably a million introductions to Ellen by now. I think there was a, an introduction to PureScript uh, last time at this meetup. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been doing things like TypeScript. Have you seen any like introduction to TypeScript talks? No, nah, either. One person has seen one. That's okay. There's there's a market for that then, I guess. Um, but really, I don't want to just show you my favorite language and why I, I like my favorite language. It might not even apply to you. And more importantly, I don't want you to pick a favorite language. That's the most horrible thing you can do to yourself as a programmer, to settle down and get comfy in one language and do everything using that language, like the thing with, with when the only tool you got is a hammer and so on. Uh, what I'd like to do instead is how, have a look at how some of these languages are designed, what the intentions behind them are, and try and sort of encourage you to, to evaluate the lot of them yourself. So I'm going to sort of try and teach you, uh, give you a rough idea of, of how to design a programming language, though I'm not going to be technical about it at all. I'm just going to introduce you to some perspectives that you can apply to, to evaluate a programming language. And in particular, because this is functional programming for the web, I'm going to focus on functional languages that compile to JavaScript. Because there's a lot of choice in that area right now. It must be fairly bewildering. Uh, it certainly is for me. Let's jump in. So my very first lesson to you, this is the important bit. There is no silver bullet. Remember that. Specifically, what I mean is if you think there's a right way and a wrong way to design a programming language, you should not be thinking that. You need to stop doing that right away. There are trade-offs. Every decision that goes into a, how a programming language uh, ends up looking and working is based on a trade-off. Like, you might think every language needs a type system. And it has got people in the audience. I know you think this. Anyone? Uh, somebody admitting to it? <laughs> I'm, I'm partial to this attitude myself. Um, you might think no language needs a type system. So I, I, I know certain language cults which go very hard on, on this one. Um, you might even think every language should be home iconic. Um, home iconic in this case means you just put a lot of parentheses around everything. I was subtweeting common lisp there. 
You might think, oh, oh, object orientation is the only way to write good software. Right, who thinks that? Show of hands. It's actually booze. <laughs> so you might think it's the devil. <laughs> Scattered cheers. I, I think maybe this audience is sort of biased, perhaps. Uh, there is no right answer here. And and why would you even need to choose? I mean, so so who thinks um, it's got to be either OO or functional? Nobody wants to admit this. Of course, there's a lot of languages which which are both OO and functional. Scala being a great example, and they seem to do it quite well. Uh, I might even venture to, to claim that Haskell is slightly object-oriented, at least um, at the type level. But that's not really the point of it. Um, in certain problem spaces, object orientation is brilliant. In certain problem spaces, it will just completely get in your way. And there are many, many ways of doing object orientation. It's not just the Java way. There's, I'm, I'm reliably informed, also the small talk way, if anybody remembers that nowadays. Erlang has a take on it. Uh, it it's all generally based on what you want to achieve with your language. In the end, it doesn't matter how you design it. Whether you put types in there, whether you put classes in there, whether you put the classes in, the classes in at the type level or at the runtime level, it does not matter. There is no silver bullet. Things on the other hand which do matter, you need to decide what the language is, is, is meant to do and you need to, to decide who you're building it for. Like Elm is a great example. Elm is mostly designed to build web applications. It, it's, it's very focused on the specific task of writing programs that run in web pages. It's also designed very specifically to be easy to learn and, and avoids, very deliberately avoids certain concepts that it's using um, behind the scenes to not sort of scale off and just let you get on with actually building the application. That's very important. What's the language meant to accomplish? And what is your target audience? And you need to hit the right level of, of, of abstraction for the job. Once again, Elm is a very good example. And if you've been paying attention to Elm, it, it started off being um, very big on the functional reactive programming stuff where um, you build everything using essentially wiring signals together. And then suddenly in Elm 017, they dropped that completely and just sort of put that into the runtime instead. So whether or not building applications using, using FOP is a good idea, you don't really, that sort of cognitive overhead that you don't really need to know anymore to build a, even a very complicated application in, in Elm. That's because Elm was very specific about hitting the, the right level of, of abstraction for the job. And this is really important. If you're building a language, you don't stop at the compiler. You don't just, or, or the interpreter, if, if, if that's your thing. You, you don't just implement the language and then you're done. There's a lot more to it. There's tooling. There's a lot of tooling that needs to go into a, a successful language, especially nowadays. I mean, you need a package manager at the very least. Or, yeah, you end up eventually with something horrible like, like new auto tools, God help us all. Um, documentation builders. What else is there? Oh, yes. Uh, maybe even code formatting tools. And, and, and of course, um, all the tooling around making your IDE, your editor, whatever you use, understand the language. and, and enable you to work efficiently uh, writing code in the language. Very important. And documentation. 
So the one limited Haskell program in, in the room will, will know that the, the only kind of documentation you need really is a type signature, which if you're like a Haskell programmer, you're probably smart enough to, to make do with that. Most people actually need a lot of documentation um, explaining to not just how the language is, how the language syntax fits together, how the semantics fits together, but how you actually sit down and build things in it. And the more documentation there is, the more successful, very likely, your language is going to be. I mean, you should be writing books. The first thing you should do after implementing the compiler is sit down and, and write a book about your language, like an introduction to language A. If you haven't been doing that, then I don't know why you're designing languages. Uh, is there an Elm book now? I thought I saw one. Uh, the the um, the PureScript uh, language, imp the the not the implementer, the uh, the inventor, I guess, has already written a huge and and very readable book about PureScript. Um, it's it's all completely out of date again now after the after the last release, but that's today. Oh, it's not a breaking change though. That was 09. So yeah, essentially in PureScript 09, um, the latest version that breaks everything just came out a couple of weeks ago and it's been quite a struggle just for, for library authors to catch up. And, and now Phil Freeman is, is frantically updating the book to make sure that all the code, the code examples actually work. But he's doing that. I mean, you have to. That's how you, you get a language adopted. You have to have a lot of documentation. Community helps as well. Documentation, I think, is paramount. And most importantly, perhaps, when looking at a language design, you don't want surprises. You don't want like 100 ways, 100 different ways of doing a particular thing. I'm not looking at you, Ruby, but I, I could say things about that. Um, actually, you know what? Let's talk about JavaScript. So I, I got a couple of code examples here. I'm just going to run through them, and, and I'm going to have you guess what, what, what's going to happen when I run these. Uh, so type of nan. What is the type of? Do you know what nan is? Na, nan, it literally means not a number. Type of nan. And obviously, the type of nan is number. <laughs> Actually, that sort of makes sense because nan is is part of the specification for for floating point uh, numbers that JavaScript happens to use. So, what about equality? Nan equals nan. Obviously, obviously, that's false. <laughs> I wonder if that also maybe sort of makes sense. I'm not clear on, on the spec here, but it's surprising. So I mean, the the equality thing in JavaScript that's such that, that there's so much going on there that that nobody at this point can really predict what what is going to happen until he actually runs some code. And mind you, I'm I'm running this on on Chrome, which is uh, the V8 engine, and it's not given that this is going to work the same way across engines. Certainly, uh, back in the day, you had the reference implementation of JavaScript, uh, Rhino, written in Java of all things, which had the most peculiarly bizarre ways of doing things. Like, there wasn't really a specification at the time, except Rhino was sort of, if, if it worked that way in Rhino, it should work that way everywhere else. And Rhino had some bizarre ideas of how things should work. Now there's a spec, it should be predictable, it isn't always. So anyway, um, truthiness in JavaScript is interesting. So essentially, um, the, the Boolean logic in JavaScript, what values um, constitute either true or false? Empty array, is that true or false? True. Yes. Empty string. 
true, false. True. Empty array is falsy. Empty. No, sorry, empty array is truthy. Empty string is falsy. What about null? Is null falsy? No. <laughs> Null is, I think it's false in certain circumstances. I wonder if the, the thing here is that I'm using the double equals instead of the triple equals. Uh, this is obviously false though, because null and false are different values. Triple equals does, um, does no type coercion. This, in this case, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I guess it doesn't in, in the case of null, it's, it's exciting. Okay, let's do addition. So you all know this one, two plus two is four. Two plus string two, that's a type error, right? You can't add the string in a number. Four, it's 22, it's string 22. What goes on there is, is, is the, the plus is, is overloaded and JavaScript has some bizarre rules about, um, about what to convert into what and if there's a string then usually everything gets turned into strings and concatenated including the, the number two. What if the string is first? That's obvious, that's 22. This one's interesting though, two plus two plus number two. 42? I could guess, not a number. <laughs> How about if the two is in the middle? Two, 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 good guess. Okay. Should I reload the page just to clear this? Let's do it. So we can start off from the top again. Uh, it still loads. Okay, how about multiplication? Two plus string, two, sorry, two multiplied by string two. Two, two, four. F number four, number four. In the case of multiplication, a JavaScript turns the string into a number. What about string two first? That's also full. That's what happens. It's just, yeah, it surprises you. And I mean, th this is the cheap shot, but um, this is perhaps the thing that I consider the most ill-advised in JavaScript. Um, so I have an object called ponies. It's got a, properly, a property uh, called best which obviously contains Pinkie Pie. So, ponies.best, that gets us the string Pinkie Pie. Now, who's the worst pony? Oh, you should know this. This is not a matter of personal taste or anything. This is like objective truth. The worst pony is Princess Celestia. Uh, so if I get the worst pony um, out of the ponies object, what's gonna happen? Yeah. So you might think that maybe JavaScript's type system picks, it, picks this up. Uh, knowing that there is no property called worst on this object, or at the very least, uh, maybe it would throw an error at runtime because we've seen it can do that. Like if I go and define dot worst, it literally says there is no property worst. But if I go ponies dot worst, I get undefined back. My REPL doesn't print undefined. It doesn't know whether I was actually expecting undefined or if I, if I was just defining code. But that's what happens. You get undefined back, which leads to essentially where there should be an error, it just silently returns you an undefined. And then the error propagates and, and occurs somewhere else because of this. That is not a language design. I mean, it has side effects. I, I mean, it's not entirely horrific. It, it allows you to write code sometimes. I mean, as long as you know what you're doing, um, it, it allows you to write more succinct code for like checking whether a property exists. Instead of it doing like object does has, object dot has own property. You can just go bonus at worst, returns undefined, so it's not defined. But yeah, you can do that. And you can also break your program in really surprising ways without noticing, which is not a great thing. Let's do some more JavaScript. So pro tips, did you know numbers form a commutative summary? That means that you can do addition and, and multiplication on numbers. So I got a function, it's called add. 
and two and three. That returns five. Yay. And of course, add two and string three, it returns 23. Now, can you imagine a language where I can actually sort of prevent this? I mean, ideally, this plus operator would only take uh, actual numbers and not try and be everything for all data types. Oh, incidentally, what's, what's this? Not a number, ah, obviously, certainly not a number. Uh, but okay, so unfortunately plus takes a lot of things, as we can see. Um, what if we could restrict that a bit? Let's say we could add time checking to the language. Just as a theoretical exercise in, in how to to have a chat with your compiler about the program that you've, ri you've written. So add two and three now is five. Add two and string three is, oops, a fairly readable error. Ah, argument of type of string is not assignable to parameter of type number. It's a bit of jargon, but um, with a bit of practice, you can easily read that this means that, oops, you've used a string where a number was required. This is TypeScript. And already we can start seeing the um, sort of the, the slight usability improvement in JavaScript. Did I have another one? Oh no. Um, so what I was getting at there is the best way to design a language is to design a language in such a way that you can have a conversation with a compiler about the software that you're building and get feedback. It, or not necessarily the, the compiler, perhaps you've got um, a tightly integrated REPL experience, like in something like Clojure, you are sort of still talking to the runtime and getting useful information back. But a compiler is particularly good at this, um, and a type system is this tr tremendously, as we just saw with, with TypeScript. I'm actually just gonna go and dive in right now and show you a couple of language experiences. So here's my Emacs. I'm gonna do the rest in, in my Emacs from now on because I didn't have time to write wrappers for all the languages. Um, here's Flow. Flow is, is, is a bit like TypeScript in that it's essentially JavaScript, but uh, type checking has been added. And they're very, very similar. There, there are subtle differences. Um, in TypeScript, you sort of buy into TypeScript. Um, TypeScript has the, um, the file name extension .ts, and only the .ts files will get type checked. The .js files are assumed to work. Uh, I believe TypeScript nowadays is, is moving towards being able to sort of try and type check the JavaScript as well. But initially it was, the type checking was restricted to where you decided we are now going to be TypeScript. Whereas Flow is designed to type, to type check JavaScript that doesn't even have um, type annotations. Like this program right here. This is plain JavaScript. I've only added the uh, app flow thing and a bit for Emacs to understand that is flow as opposed to JavaScript. So you can see what this, essentially what best pony is gonna be, the value. Obviously Pinkie Pie is best pony. Um, more interestingly though, Actually, I'm going to turn the font up way high because you need to see the line right at the bottom. Watch that. I can ask the runtime. Actually, the, the flow type, type checker is sort of running in the background as a daemon right now and doing incremental type checking on my code. So at this point, it should already have type checked this. I can actually... Get me a shout. Go into the flow folder. Ooh, <laughs> that rebel is too wide. Um, that prompt, sorry. Um, and I can run flow. It says no errors. Brilliant. So 
Where's Pony? Is Pony stop? So no RS. I can also at this point. So I can ask for the type of of um, a token. In this case, uh, the variable ponies. What what's the type of the variable ponies? It's an object with the properties best, which is a string, and worst, which is a string. And Flo's been able to infer this because obviously that's how it is in the code. So when I get ponies of best, the type of best pony is a string. And worst pony likewise is a string. And a mediocre pony. These are very contrived examples, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. So a mediocre pony, what is the type of mediocre pony? Actually, there's a type error. If I run flat flow now, it's easier to see over here, I thought, except the font is very small. It says property mediocre, property not found in the object literal ponies. And in my editor, I will get a highlighted red line saying there is something wrong with your code. This is not going to fly at runtime. And it will tell me the error. And I can actually do something about it. Uh, I had another one here. I call this map.js. Let's get fancy with a bit of category theory. So of course, everybody knows that a functor is um, a, a collection type or a container type and a map function. And in JavaScript, an example of a functor would be an array. Here we have an array. This is actually uh, more of a tuple in terms of the, of, of the type system. It's able to infer that much. It's an array of length three with three strings in it. That's interesting. I didn't notice that the first time around. So now I've actually gone and added um, very specific type signatures. I have a function map. It has two type variables, A and B. A type variable is um, a type that we don't know the exact type of. It could be a string, it could be a number. The only thing we know for sure is that A is always just one type. Same with B. And this function map takes one argument, a function called F, which has this type. It is a function which takes one argument, A, of type uh, type variable a, and it returns a new argument. Uh, sorry, it returns a new value of type b. Oh yes, and it takes another, obviously, another argument, which is an array of, of type a, and that gets us an array of type b. And the implementation, I'm just reusing uh, JavaScript's map here. Um, so at this point, this should type check fine. Oh, yeah. I should fix my code in the other buffer first. So flow has no errors. Now, if I were to do something ridiculously stupid here, actually, this should type check. This would just be an empty array of type B. But if I return like pinky pie, we get an error. It's saying. Yeah, this is the, an array of string. That's what, not what we were expecting here. Actually, how do you even know it's a string? And should we try and do things with it? Uh, map function s s to two uppercase. We have tab completion. No, we do. That's another nice feature of, of flow, incidentally. It's able to guess that this might be too uppercase. Uh, and ponies. So this would get us Pinkie Pie rarity and Discord capitalized. Fortunately, I don't really know how to run this for you. I didn't prepare a, a, a REPL for it. Um, more interestingly, we could do maybe pass int. Oh, this, these are stupid examples, aren't they? Because I have no idea how to make this fail. I want to see this, the, the type errors in this case. I, I picked an example that's too easy. 
So the math function is fine, but we could do crazy things here and mostly it would just work. Yeah, so let's leave flow. Uh, that's another language that I'm slightly more excited about, which you've just seen. Um, here's an end program. Um, and there should be fairly good editor, editor integration here. I should be able to compile this straight off from the compiler. So the end compiler runs in, in the other window here. It's compiled successfully. This is the most basic form of, of Hello World in Elm. Um, so unfortunately, Elm is very browser focused. So I'm gonna need to actually go in the browser. That wasn't what I meant to do. And show you this from a static file server. So what I've done, ooh, it says, hello, Joe. Look at that. What this, done, what this has done is it's created a text node, um, a DOM node, an HTML. Uh, essentially, it's put the text Hello Joe into the body of the HTML document that I just loaded. More interestingly, I could do this bit. So these are, are, are basically just functions which take two arguments. Uh, the function name is the, um, is the, is the uh, name of the HTML element that you want to create. The, second, the first argument is the list is a list of um, properties. And the second argument is a list of children. So I am essentially created an unnumbered list with five list elements in it. And these have the text Pinkie Pie's Pest Pony inside them. So let's compile. It works. Reload. It says Pinkie Pie's Pest Pony. So let's try and actually do something slightly more complicated. Like, I don't want to be repeating all this, these list uh, items. I can make a function to create them. So, pony phi, let's call it pony phi. It takes a pony name, which is a string, and it returns an ally with no properties and the text, the variable pony. So I should be able to map pony phi over, I need a variable ponies. Pinky pie is best. Pony. I'm going big on the useful examples today. Oh, so what's that? <laughs> it thinks I might have a typo. Yes, yes. So the thing with um, with Elm is it doesn't have type classes. We'll get to this slightly later. Um, so we need to be specific about exactly what sort of map function we mean. We don't. We aren't able to generalize map to like any data structure by magic. We need to be specific and say list up map. So what happens then? Function URL is expecting the second argument to be a list, but it is a function. The map function, ha. Huh. Suggestions. Actually, um, it's trying to be helpful. It's telling us, uh, it's scrolling too fast. And now it's scrolling too slowly. So it, it's trying to tell us that arguments are evaluated from left to right. The problem here is that I am passing the map function in as the second argument. What I mean to do is the result of this. So I need to add parentheses. Top level value of ponyfy does not have a type annotation. Ah, oh, that's easy to fix. This is perhaps my favorite bit about Elm. So you'll notice that, that the, um, the compiler has suggested, uh, has actually inferred types. 
Alms type system um, is so simple that you can't do the thing, such a thing as generalizing the map function. You need to be specific about listed map. But that happens to also mean that you get perfect type inference. So for every bit of code that you write, Elm is going to, to be able to know exactly what the type of that code is, which means I can just do, in this case, control C, control A and Emacs, and boom. It's gone and added the type on annotations for us. It's actually added this one underneath, which is unexpected. It's fine, probably still compiles. So now we're done, it works. Well, and you get exactly the same result. Should we be slightly more, more interesting? So in addition to doing the ponyfy, actually before ponyfy, can we add string dot to upper, I think it's called, and then compose those two functions together. This is the, uh, the function composition operator in them. It, it essentially, it takes um, a function from A to B and a function from B to C and gets your function from A to C, which means that it first runs the first function and then it runs the second function on the result of the first function and makes a, a single function out of that. Which means that before we actually call Ponyfy, we take the string and we uppercase it. And we compile, Ooh. the qualifier string is not in scope. I'm slightly, slightly disappointed now because it's not telling me how to fix that. I've sort of come to expect from it that it's really helpful with the error messages. Actually, oh no, I got um, ID integration for this. So control C, control I. I know that string is in core. There's string and it suggests the input statement input string and it adds it for me. Woohoo. Now this is exciting. <laughs> Yes, it's capitalized. The wonders of M. OK. So I think the main benefit of M is um, one thing you don't really have to, t to think too much about uh, types. And you don't really have to think too much about, oh, yeah, formatting. Check this one out. Uh, what was it? I need to actually consult my, my cheat sheet. Um, control C, Control F. So Elm has a canonical formatting style. There's, in, in Elm, there's no, there's no war about tabs versus spaces or, or commas first or anything like that. It's just, there's a program that takes your Elm code and, and it formats it the way it's supposed to be. So Control C, Control F, boom. This is like officially formatted Elm code. So mostly I find in Emacs, um, the editor will, will be very helpful in formatting for you as you type. But I've seen um, Sublime Text users who, who write M code and just write the sloppiest, most disgusting M code you've seen. They don't care, they just, they just hit the format button and it all looks perfect. There's a lot of thought gone into the tooling in M, which I really like. Oh, another thing I need to show you. Uh, where's my shell? I'm going to assume now that the internet work, which is probably very stupid of me, but we're done with the Elm examples anyway, so it doesn't really matter if this breaks. So I just deleted the Elm stuff bit, which is where it's like no modules for Elm. And now if I run the compiler, it's actually smart enough that it realizes, oh yeah, you're missing all your dependencies. I should go download them for you and then compile them. And we're done. So if you've done node development, how many times have you done like um, um, a git pull and ran your code and everything breaks because something changed in the package JSON and you forgot to do npm uh, install? No worries, Elm's got your back. It's got all, all these really nice little features like the unpackage manager won't allow you to uh, publish a package with an incorrectly bumped Semva version, because it can actually check the types of the code that you're exporting and see if you should be bump bumping it differently. So if you have a breaking change and you haven't bumped the, ma the, major, the major version, Elm won't let you publish the package. How awesome is that? Okay, that's enough Elm. 
something slightly dearer to my heart. Here's some pure script. So I need to show you something about Elm that I don't like. So Elm um, make, oh no, I compiled it already. So the Elm.js file, just for doing this, is 165,000 bytes. There's a lot of runtime in Elm. Of course, this can be really good. It means that you don't really have to worry about like pulling in frameworks and learning how to use them and all that. Elm is essentially its own framework. That's a lot of code though. I could uglify it uh, with a dash C, just to be sure. Uh, min.js, see how small that is. This will do a fair bit of dead code elimination. Oh, I need to actually, <laughs> sorry. Any broken shell? There you go. I need to actually, of course, specify the input file, elm.js. Now it's 108 kilobytes, that's still quite a bit. That's about as small as Elm gets just doing Hello World, more or less. Might not be a problem, sometimes it is, which is actually what led me to, to PureScript because I, I was building some software that had a very strict space requirement. So here's PureScript, Hello World. So I can run the build tool. Uh, and I can have it run this little program. And it's building. And it goes, hello, Joe, at the end. I can have this uh, optimize and compile to, well, ps.js. Not even going to uglify it. PSR chairs is 997 bytes. Let's see how it looks. Ah, that's it. I mean, there's a bit of boilerplate, but mostly it's just a console.log segment. That's an advantage of PureScript over ALM. Um, now let's look at some error messages, because <laughs> I feel like I have to be fair in my evaluation of the language. Let's try, try and do the same thing that we were doing with the ELM. As, uh, so I could do something like log pinky, just copy that a couple of times, pi is best. Pony, and then essentially do the same thing that I was doing with the ELM, just see that this works first. Okay. So that means first I need a ponies list. Pinkie Pie is best. Pony, obviously. Oh, it says, uh, there was no type declaration provided. The input type of ponies was array of string. Missing type declarations are potentially very bad in PureScript because uh, the type system is, is quite a bit more complicated than ARM. So it might not be able to infer the correct type. It might actually have unintended um, consequences if you don't add the type annotation you think it should have. Uh, so Used to be I could just hit a button, just like an arm, to get that. that. So I, I actually wrote the code in Emacs to do that. Uh, it was merged into the upstream pure rip mode, and now it doesn't work anymore. Other people's code, you know. So what I should be able to do is control C or S, and that's the type signature, but the actual code has gone missing. <laughs> It's a bug, it'll get fixed, don't worry. So I have to type this out, array of string, yay. 
And then the ponyfy function. So ponyfy pony returns a log action of pony. So this is running on Node, not uh, in a browser. So I'm not creating HTML. I'm creating IO side effects in this case, um, a log statement. So if I pass a log statement back as the return value of main, then it will get run and, and the text will come up on, on screen. Um, so essentially, it's probably going to complain about a type. Now, this one is, yeah, this one's not as straightforward. So you might have noticed the, the type signature of main. For all the EF of console and the unit, that's, I'm not even going to bother to explain it. This is a good example of how PureScript might be slightly harder to learn than um, Essentially, it, it's an effect monad, which means something like an IO monad in Haskell, which means it's, it's kind of just a function that you can run at some point to run the log statement, which uh, PureScript's runtime will, will run eventually, but never mind. So I need to type ponyfy string to uh, f, same as this, just going to steal it, this. Yay. So now, oh, it's still got an error. What's that? While checking, type variable e is undefined. Oh, yes. So unlike in Elman Haskell, you have to actually specifically declare all type variables. In, in pure scripts, so I have to go for all e, nitpicky. Okay, so now I should be able to map ponyfy over ponies, and that should be it. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Almost really, really nice, helpful error messages and. So the thing is, this is actually, oh, I got 40 minutes of battery left. Good thing I'm almost done. So the thing is, with PureScript, uh, the type system is very powerful and very expressive. That comes with a price of actually, I don't believe it's even possible to tell the difference between the type that it was expecting and the type that you passed in. It, it can only say these two types don't match and they should, and it can't tell you which is which which is quite surprising and, and doesn't lend itself to good error messages. Um, what it's actually complaining about here is that what I get out of this is that I get um, an array of effect monads uh, or actions, they're called, let's call them actions, don't say the M word. Uh, and what it needs is just one effect. Um, what I would do here normally is I would go to this lovely web page called Pursuit, and I would type in the type signature of the function that I want in this case, which would, I think, be uh, foldable of monad of A to monad of A. No, monad of unit, probably. Um, this is the most generalized form of the function I'm looking for. This also requires a bit of experience with PureScript just to get that far. But a very cool thing is that I could just input this into the search engine on Pursuit, and it will find me the correct function. Unfortunately, because of the aforementioned 0.9 breakage, Pursuit currently doesn't work. So I can't show you that. Um, you're just going to have to believe me. I actually found it. This is the function. This is Pursuit. It, you can still go there and see docs, but you can't search. 13 minutes of battery left. Um, probably way out of time anyway. Um, the function I'm looking for is sequence underscore. That essentially takes, so this is PureScript's gener generalizability thing. So instead of having a list or an array, we can generalize it to anything that you can fold over, a foldable. And so this will be an array of effect of A, A being unit in this case, which means no return value to an effective unit. This collapses. Collapses the, um, the list of effects into one effect. 
and there's still an error. What is the error? Unknown value sequence. Oh, yeah. Sequence is in this, this library that you need to import. So Pure Compiler is also fairly smart. I can hit Control-C, Control-I, and it asks me, oh, do you mean the sequence in data foldable or data traversable? I mean foldable. And it's added that for me. A function is like unique cannot be applied to, to the argument ponies. Uh, this is just the parentheses again. I think this is it. Now it's reporting no errors. And woohoo, Pinkie Pie is best pony. Should we bother with a capitalization? No, I'm going to run out of battery. So let's conclude the pure strip example. Okay. So I added this slide during the previous talk. Uh, you were talking about ports in Elm and how clunky they are. Uh, ports are kind of cool, but they're also really hard to use at, at the current time. And I think Evan's not really prioritized getting the, the FFI working. FFI is, is the foreign function interface, which is how a language would interact with the environment that it's running in. For instance, if you have something that compiles to native, you'll probably have an interface to, to call C libraries because there's a lot of them. In, in the case of Elm and PureScript, it would be how you call JavaScript functions or use JavaScript libraries that already exist. Um, so the Elm story is not great. The PureScript story is, is, is slightly better. There's this package management issue. Uh, it were, because, because PureScript uses Bower for package management, which surprises a lot of people. It, it just happened to be a good fit. It's awful for JavaScript which is what most people um, react to. It's, it's quite good for PureScript. Um, unfortunately, all JavaScript libraries come as NPM packages. And you kind of have to do both. And, and right now, you have to kind of do it manually. But it's a lot easier to write FFI uh, functions in PureScript. You basically just uh, you type out the, the, the type signature of it in your PureScript code, and you add a, Jav a JavaScript file with some JavaScript code that, that calls it. Works out all really well. Of course, in the case of Flow and TypeScript, you're literally writing JavaScript, so there's no need for an FFI. You might want to, to sort of add type annotations when you're using um, other people's code. But that's the only thing you have to do. It's, it's JavaScript, so it just works. So to summarize, PureScript is an expressive, generic language. PureScript is, is has so small a runtime that you can basically just run it in anywhere that takes JavaScript. You, you saw me running Node. It's, it runs just as fine in the browser. It's sort of up to you. It's at that level. Um, it provides a high degree of type safety while expressing complex abstractions. Um, like I, I'm able to, to abstract away the idea of, of the container types. I don't need to worry about lists or which list type I'm going to use when I'm implementing a function. I can just call it a foldable. Um, comes at a price. Uh, the type system is quite hard to learn. All the terminology, I mean, you do have functions, applicatives, monads, um, pro functors, what have you. It's a very, very steep learning curve. And there's also the, the problem that the type system is so complex that the compiler doesn't necessarily give you very understandable error messages. Eight minutes left. Awesome. So there is that. Elm, on the other hand, it's a highly specialized language. As you've seen, there's a huge runtime. But that's basically your entire framework sorted. You don't need to put in Ember or React or anything like that in the case of Elm. You just write some very concise code, and you got a full web application, basically. Uh, the problem is, of course, that I actually tried to, to write some AMP code for Node, and I couldn't do it. There's just no support for it right now. Um, that's a trade-off. It's a lot easier to write AMP, but there's a payload to it. And the simple type system gives you perfect error messages and ID support and, and whatever you need. Of course, 
you might need to write some boilerplate when dealing with like different data types, but that's fine, mostly. It's up to you whether you want to make that trade-off or not. Flow and TypeScript are um, essentially just JavaScript. There's no learning curve if you know JavaScript already. You just need to well, learn the type system. And even that is, to some extent, optional, because you can still type check uh, plain JavaScript code, as we saw in, in the Flow example, quite reasonably. It doesn't offer perfect type safety. It never could. It doesn't offer perfect type inference. It never could, because of how JavaScript, JavaScript is designed. But in the end, you're still writing JavaScript. You might have a huge uh, JavaScript code base that you would just like to add some type safety to. And at your own pace, perhaps, you might want to just start in one end and add some type signatures and get slightly better type checking. And then work your way up to um, type checking your entire code base. So you're still writing JavaScript. You're just being slightly smarter about it. And that can be a, hu a huge advantage, too, especially with legacy code. So which is better? Your opinions, please. It depends what you need. It really does. So I've tried to show you a couple of options now, and I try to to show you how it feels like to work with them, which I think is the most important part of, of picking a language. And keeping in mind that Languages are designed for different purposes. You have to figure out what you need and how much effort you're willing to put into learning it. And then you pick a language. And the next time you, you want to pick a language, you might have different requirements. You might want to pick another language. Don't get stuck. OK, I'm done. I took way too much anyway. I guess we're off to the pub. I'm gonna shut this down. Well, I spent way too much of it anyway. <laughs> um, things like, uh, let's say, close the script. I think it's got a good story on things like FFI and closure in general. Um, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, I wanted to, to mention closure script too, but I mean, I think I already used like an hour. <laughs> I think that was enough. Closure script is interesting. Uh, I think it's got pretty much the same problems as Elm, except you don't have the nice type system, but you do have the immutable data structures every, everywhere, which can be really powerful. There's, there's a proper place for that too, definitely. And the FFI is definitely not bad. This is true. Was there a question, or were you just wanted, wanting to point it out? <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Closure script is cool. Uh, do you happen to know how big the Hello World for a GHC JS app is? Oh, yeah, that's another thing I wanted to, to talk about and I decided not to. Uh, <laughs> GHC JS is huge. I mean, it's a, it's a very cool piece of, of, uh, of engineering. You can literally take uh, Haskell code and compile it to JavaScript. So if you've got Haskell on the server, uh, GHCJS might be something you want to look into. But the runtime is, is enormous, because Haskell semantics are very, very, very different from JavaScript. And you have to have a runtime that implements all these things, like all the laziness and whatnot. And that's not easy to accomplish. So GHCJS, it works really well. It's really, really, really big. And it's not necessarily as fast as it could have been. But these are also trade-offs. Cheers. Thanks. Now, more questions about going to the pub. Pub it is. Thank I think you very we much. have a vote for the pub. Thank you very much, Bodil. Thank you very much, John. That's great. Um, thank you. Um, to Skillsmart for hosting us and uh, see you next month. If you want to speak, I'd appreciate you want to talk to Amy.